Hey, welcome back. It's a new day. It's a new dawn. It's the Dawn of X. Today we're going to talk about Dawn of X Marauders number one on comic book news. Hey, welcome to the bridge. Today we're going to talk about Marauders number one. Uh, the first in the line of uh, post House of X, Powers of X books, what's being called the Dawn of X, right? Before all this this reboot stuff happened, uh, they canceled all of the X-Men books, which was like a lot of books, right? The X-Men always had this huge line of spinoffs and tons of books that not many people read each one, but if you added them all up, uh, you could say that there were a lot of X-Men readers, I guess. Um, so now they canceled all that stuff, have created this entire new um, House of X, Powers of X uh, paradigm shift. And if you don't know about that, well, man, there's a playlist I can point you to. You can check out all of our videos. We covered each and every part of House of X and Powers of X that led up to today's Marauders number one. Um, so wait a minute. Why are we talking about it? Let's go uh, straight to the horse's mouth, so to speak, or should I say straight to the Million Dollar Comics cam? Marauders number one, um, Jerry Duggan and Matteo Lolly. Um, the artwork uh, is is it's pretty to look at. I think uh, Lolly is good. There's a couple storytelling quibbles I've got, and we'll get into. Um, first of all, <clears throat> the tone in general. Um, this is sort of treated a, in sort of a, a, a wacky, like screwball comedy approach. Think uh, instead of Kitty Pride, think maybe Liz Lemon with phasing powers and a dragon. Um, so the first thing we find out right away is that Kitty Pride cannot use the Krakoan portals, right? Uh, in the the new mutant Krakoan society, uh, their public transportation system is uh, are these Krakoan portal flowers that you can that can grow anywhere, uh, not just on this planet, but apparently, but anywhere. And uh, wherever you grow one, it's a portal directly back to Krakoa. Um, Kitty Pride, despite being able to walk through walls and walk through anything and being uh, ethereal and immaterial, she can't pass through the portals. Isn't that funny? In fact, like she walks straight into it and like breaks her nose. And here we go. Marauders, issue number one, I'm on a boat, right? And that title right there tells you it's we're not taking ourselves too, too seriously for this book, which... Um, on the one hand is refreshing, right? We don't want to, we don't need uh, everything to be super serious all the time. On the other hand, it, it can be tough to walk that line and do the comedy action thing. I personally think the best it's ever been done was uh, back in the old Justice League, Keith Giffen uh, days, but that's just my opinion. Um, so we're going to get more of these text pieces here, and this is another place where they're in this case, they're kind of trying to use it to inject some comedy. And one of the major comedy elements of this book is that Kitty Pride likes to drink. Period. That's kind of a, a joke, I guess. Like, she's a drinker. She likes to get drunk. She makes she gets drunk a lot and does dumb things and makes mistakes and stuff and gets drunk a lot in this book. I don't know why this is good. Um, or, you know, maybe it's not, but um, she's kind of a lush. So anyway, uh, she was on a boat. She, she, since she couldn't uh, uh, go through the portal, she had to take a boat to Krakoa, even though she mentions, oh, I could have just got magic to teleport me, but something about it that being too easy or something. Basically just kind of a plot device to get us to say, Kitty Pride sails the seven seas, right? She can't just do the Krakoan portal thing. I don't know why she can't fly. I, I, it's not really talked about. Anyway, um... We get to Krakoa. She gets to the island. Want to see if she can use the portal from the other side. No, she cannot. She meets up with her old buddy, Bob Drake Iceman, <clears throat> and uh, reveals that um, the big reason she she was on the boat was she was bringing supplies for Wolverine. Bringing, guess what? Brewskis. And we get a chance to use one of these full page text bonus elements to get a funny shopping list from Logan 
who wants ribs and whiskey and beer and sandwiches and pomade and coffee and uh, and funny little jokes. I'm putting funny in quotes. Um, okay, so Bobby can still use the portal. Everybody can use the portal. Food just grows on the trees. Like there's meat. There's like uh, mutton chops growing on the uh, on the trees here in Krakoa. And uh, now Kate is, despite being in Krakoa, has summoned it mentally into a meeting with Emma Frost, who has extended like an invitation to her. Basically, um, the idea is this: in this new world, uh, the the Krakoan mutant society has brokered deals with most of the world's nations. They will accept these super drugs created by Krakoa in exchange for full acceptance and amnesty for mutants. Um, unfortunately, not every country has accepted that, including a lot of like uh, uh, dictatorships and regimes and stuff. So realizing that that will be the case and that there will be a black market for these drugs in those places, they've decided to get ahead of this and have uh, this sort of dark unit of the, 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 the Hellfire Corporation, which is dealing in the drugs legitimately around the world, well, this branch will deal in the black market side and at the same time sort of function as a mutant underground railroad, if you will. In other words, freeing mutants that live in those countries that have not struck the amnesty deal and being able to bring those mutants back to Krakoa. So this is our high concept. And what we're seeing is that all over the world, like in Russia, they've, you know, barricaded the portals. And in other countries, they're creating these mutant eating creatures. So we've got all kinds of potential mutant saving missions for our new team, whatever they might be called. Uh, we reveal uh, uh, nothing much is revealed. They, she, she offers that deal and, and, and they kind of dance around the what it is all they make one mention she says something she says uh you will ravish in red put yourself in my hands if you deserve it and we'll talk about what we think that means um anyway uh we go to a mission in russia the russians have armor that you shoots beams that can negate mutant powers that seems like a game changing kind of technology to me i don't know but it's sort of treated here as like a whatever moment and and bobby is his powers go away and he's in his underwear and his flip-flops who knew he was wearing flip-flops under the, under the ice uh and he dives back out through the portal oh man i almost just died and he's like working or playing i'm serious now this brings up a point that I've made. Like, who cares if you die? Because now they can resurrect mutants, right? So the worst we would do is Bobby would lose a, like a week's worth of memories. That is the worst case scenario here if he had died there. So to me, where is there any drama in that at all? Who I don't care if he dies. He shouldn't really care. They should be willing to like almost be like crazy suicidal in in their any um action right so another reason why i just don't think this whole resurrection protocol thing can survive long term for, just for what it at least not for at all mutants because of what it does to drama and storytelling anyway he gets back and nope oh, kitty pride's been drinking again and she's ready to kick some butt i want to go fight some aggro humans and um Next, we get a two pages we cut for whatever reason to Taipei, Taiwan. And here we've got a lady giving an anti-mutant kind of speech saying her husband disappeared in the park and who should show up but deep undercover, I guess, Bishop. I mean, if you're sending a guy undercover to to Chinese, <laughs> to China, who is going to stick out more possibly than like the black, humongous black guy with cornrows and a giant M on his face? Whatever. He was wearing a hat, though. <laughs> so anyway, uh, he says that she's here to investigate. She doesn't want anything to do with it. He says, Xavier, something's bad. Something's rotten in, tai in Taipei. That's it. Is this going to spin off into the other comics? Is this where we're getting going with like X-Factor or one of the other books? I, I think maybe. I'm not sure. It's not very well established why. Maybe that will pay off later. 
if we care. Next, another consequence of this sort of mutant resurrection protocol is that we can take mutants who were who've been dead uh, for a long time in continuity and bring any of them back. So they're bringing back the original Australian Pyro, who apparently uh, I was reading had died of, I guess the uh, uh, the legacy virus. And uh, Iceman is really surprised, like, oh, you're the original Pyro, because I guess the new Pyro is gay and slept with Iceman in a previous issue or something like that. That's not talked about here, but I just read that in some backstory stuff. Anyway, interesting. Um, but kind of weird to bring back the old characters like that. And not too much explanation. He's just like, yeah, last thing I remembered, I was gone, and now well, here I am. I'm Pyro. Let's join the team. Anyway, they're fighting... Um, the, the, uh, the, the power sucking Russian armored dude. And next we get what I will admit is a, a, a pretty cool action sequence, uh, with Kitty Pride. Uh, we get to see her as kind of a badass. I mean, she does have martial arts training from Wolverine and the X-Men and everything else. Her power really makes her essentially untouchable unless she wants to be. And she has very fine control over that. She's a master of that power. And we get to see that put to good use here. Although here's something I found interesting. So like he strips the powers from these people. She comes up and she uses her powers, sneaks up on him and disrupts the power armor, the power disrupting armor. Okay. That makes sense. That's her powers always done that to machinery and stuff. But then what happened here? Did he eject from the armor? Did the armor disappear? Did she phase him out? Because that's that she wouldn't normally do something like that. But it, it's a storytelling um, problem. I don't understand what happened there. Maybe I'm dumb. Anyway, Kitty Pride kicking ass over several pages is actually a pretty darn cool action sequence. And they bring in a tank and she's doing cool stuff. She's able to just phase right in there and pull the pin on the grenade and phase out, which I think is awesome. Somebody attacks her with a sword, just an excuse to get her into a sword and have this sort of like pirate look she's been working on come together. Uh, next, we get another weird storytelling thing. Like Pyro is like, hey man, I need a light, right? Because Pyro's powers, he doesn't, he can't create fire, he can control fire, right? So he's like, oh, I need fire. And then Lockheed comes and blow, blows some fire. He's like, oh, I got dragon fire, boom, okay. Maybe it was written in a script that way, but then you're drawing Pyro wearing his flamethrowers. This, the tubes and stuff, that's his flamethrowers that creates the fire. Maybe it's out, maybe it's empty, but that's not established at all. This seems more like they, he drew it without realizing the writer intended him to not have that and maybe to just be Pyro without the flamethrowers. Anyway, it's a minor thing, but it's a storytelling thing that takes me out right out of the story and I hate that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, Pyro, uh, they're fighting, they fight the Russians, they fight them off, it's good stuff, um, and this is when they're, they're filming this and they're freeing the mutants and Kitty, Kitty Pride decides she's gonna go full on cheese ball and say, hey, if you're a mutant and can't get to Krakoa, then the Marauders will bring you home, right? This is when she's declared themselves as the Marauders. Why? I don't know, right? The Marauders, who were the Marauders? They were a team of villains that worked for Mr. Sinister. and So why? Why we find out here? And she says, she comes back to town and she's talking to Storm who says, I don't love the name of Marauders. And she says, I was on the spot. And I don't know if the X-Men want to be associated with what we have to do. If I stay out here a while... Will you stay with me? Like, she doesn't know if the X-Men should be associated. So I get it. She didn't want to have anything with X in the name. Okay. Why the Marauders? Sinister is there. There's a connection to Mr. Sinister, but he's not involved with this book yet. But he probably will be, I'm guessing. This is just ham-fisted. This just feels like, let's put these cute pieces together because they kind of make sense to fit together. Okay. Anyway, um, we get to see... The Marauders uh, on their cool ship, and where are they gonna go? And Kitty, Kitty Pride. Oh, she says anywhere we want to go, and do me a favor, 
call me Kate. She's no longer Kitty Pride. She's Kate. She packs a sword. She's hard drinking. She can't teleport through portals. Uh, and she's leading the Marauders. And, well, let's get to that in a second. We get some more clues here. The Red Diamond. More of these sinister clues that are more like riddles. That are little clues. I, <clears throat> we'll, we'll come back to this. So the, the part about uh, uh, the deal that uh, em, uh, uh, <clears throat> Emma Frost struck with Kitty Pride. Basically, Kitty says yes to both your propositions. There were not two propositions that we heard. So there's an unspoken proposition. There's something. She said you'll look good in red. What this obviously is, is, uh, and this has already been tipped by some stories on the internet. There were stories of the cover of a future issue that shows that Kitty Pride will be, or Kate Pride rather, will be the red queen of uh, the Hellfire Club and the third council member uh, in uh, of 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 that wing of the uh, the Krakoan council, um, so that's where we're headed, and I guess they're teasing that, and it's going to get revealed, and it's supposed to be a big thing, but it's already been spoiled. The clues are there, but even if you sort of figured it out, who really cares that much? I don't know. Um, to be continued. And next, uh, for those of you following along with your uh, Krakoan guide, next we ship out. Uh, let's talk about, you know, the text pieces for the most part were little comedy pieces, and I don't think this is much different. Uh, you know, Sinister Secrets, uh, Sinister Secret number 13. Speaking of the black and the white, not everyone got their invite. Quite a faux pas. We hope there's not a fight. You know, some of these are too kind of opaque or too like, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, abstract to almost pin down. Uh, Sinister Secret number 15. We hear the slow boat is built to catch all the eyes, but it's the one under the radar that's really turning heads. Right? We got a lot of stuff here to unpack. I, I, a lot of these are more teased than anything else. I'm not going to read them all because, frankly, I don't have too much insight into them. Um, these extra text pieces, like I said, add to a little bit more feel, a little bit more time reading the book, but I don't know um, that this makes it worth it. I'm a little bit torn on Marauders number one. Um, I enjoyed parts of it. Um, the, the, like I said, the action scene with Kitty Pride was good, and the art for, in that respect was nice. I liked looking at it. It's got a kind of a fresh look to it. Some of the comedy was okay. Some of it was not great, so not um, the happiest about that. But um, I think I'll give number two a try, but I'm not sold on all of these Dawn of X books. I'll give the number one of all of them a shot, and I'll certainly review them on this channel. Uh, but, man, there's not enough money or more importantly enough time in the world to read bad comics right i don't have time to read comics that are not that i'm not actively enjoying on a regular basis and speaking of actively enjoying things on a regular basis you out there have been enjoying this channel so much uh that i i've, I've been zooming up the ranks getting more uh, views than ever. My last Dawn of X video was my most watched video of all time. I got more than a thousand views, which is really big for a little channel like this, and tons of watch time. And most important to me, a lot of interaction and theories going on in the comments. So uh, please chime in down there. If you haven't already, subscribe, uh, hit the notification if you wanna know when I get new videos. But most of all, hey, just keep watching, keep reading comics, and we'll see you next time.